I am really delighted to be here today to celebrate International Stuttering Awareness Day with the Irish Stammering Association. And I want to formally thank Stephen Green for inviting me to participate in the speaker series on behalf of the ISA. So today's topic is acceptance and change. And what is their relationship all about? Does acceptance mean there is no desire for change? Are you denying your stuttering when you desire to change some aspect of it? If you think they can coexist, acceptance and change, does one precede the other? Do you have to do one first, then the other? For example, does acceptance, being okay with your identity, make room for speech comfort? Or does changing the way you stutter to be more comfortable, for example, make room for acceptance? And more importantly, if stuttering is okay, shouldn't all forms of stuttering be okay? These are some of the ideas I'll address today. Just wanna let everybody know, many, most of you know me, I am not a researcher, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a philosopher, I'm a clinician with about 50 years of experience in supporting stutterers and their families in their stuttering affirming journeys. These journeys include lots of change, physically, emotionally, and fundamental beliefs. So I'm not presenting research today. I'm gonna to be presenting some of my own ideas, those that have been formed from my experience with stutterers as my teachers. So research tells us that stuttering is most often neurological and genetic. Researchers are learning more about what's happening in the brain related to linguistic and motor systems and how the environment and temperament might impact and learning as well, what we learn throughout life related to stuttering. There have been some really thoughtful discussions recently among those in the stuttering community about what might be core behaviors and what might be reactive behaviors. Um, anticipation of loss of control, for example, may very well be something that precedes disfluency, that anticipatory response. And a, a, one of the big questions is, is there a pure form of disfluency that might exist without that loss of control? That's a question I ask myself all the time. It is useful to separate, for me anyway, ontology, what is, from phenomenology, what is experienced, either conscious or unconscious. If we isolate the facts, perhaps something neurological shared by all stutterers, their lived experiences will still be vastly different when we factor in things like impact from stigma and physical and mental health associated with that, or varying levels and forms of reactivity, physical, emotional, social reactivity, or lack of it. And academic, vocational, social choices, and daily decision-making. These differences make up the individual stuttering profile. So here's the question. Is it possible to accept what is and change what is experienced if that is desired? And obviously I think so, or else I wouldn't be asking you that question. Some of you might not be exposed to avoidance reduction therapy for stuttering, ARTS. So ARTS is a stuttering affirming acceptance-based therapy approach that's appropriate for people across the lifespan. We do it with children, we do it with adults, um, everything in between. It's best provided in a group therapy setting, but we also have success in individual therapy. So today, I'm not gonna be spending a lot of time on arts, but I'm gonna be drawing upon some of the arts concepts in the next few minutes as I talk about struggle, because I think struggle is a product of conflict, okay? And conflict is very much a part of the basic roots of arts developed by Joseph Sheehan. Um, and perhaps something that can be changed. So we're gonna talk about struggle and conflict. To get started, here are some basic concepts about arts. Okay, first fluency. Striving for fluency or eliminating stuttering may be unrealistic. Stuttering will likely be present in the speech, present in the speech of those who continue to stutter in late childhood and adulthood, it may come and go, it'll be variable. But because of the variability, you know, sometimes I stutter, sometimes I don't, there can be lingering fear of stuttering. This can actually increase the likelihood of stuttering. When a person stutters, if it is evaluated as a failure, 
it can lead to efforts to hide and suppress it. This can create a problem of stuttering if stuttering becomes a problem for someone. Next, struggle. In my opinion, it's the struggle that contributes to adverse impact from stuttering. And by eliminating struggle, one can thrive with comfortable, confident disfluency. And finally, self-acceptance. Becoming open with one's identity as a person who stutters involves increasing self-acceptance. It leads to confidence and spontaneity in communication. Those are the two things that I think are very, very important in the stuttering journey. So now I'm gonna focus on struggle and talk a little bit about the theory behind arts. Um, not just physical struggle during some forms of overt stuttering. I'm not just talking about physically strutter, struggling to get words out. I'm gonna also be talking about emotional struggle, difficult feelings or disturbing thoughts or hypervigilance for those trying to hide or control their stuttering. I believe that struggle comes from conflict. My mentor, Joe Sheehan, developed the theoretical frameworks of arts, drawing from conflict theory and psychology. And he did this during the middle of 1900s. You know, he had this idea formulated in the late 1940s, published it in 1950s. Resolving these conflicts through therapy, to me, is the work of the stutterer on their arts journey. First conflict, the approach avoidance conflict, to speak or to remain silent. To me, it's a conflict of communication, to go ahead and talk or to hold back and avoid or be silent. Next is role conflict, to reveal oneself as a person who stutters or mask that identity. This is a conflict of so self-presentation, or as she and used to say, social self-presentation, reveal or mask. And finally, there's a conflict regarding control. Now, she and didn't talk about this as a conflict, but I developed this as one of the three conflicts based on his work on the, the suppression hypothesis. So the, the idea of conflict regarding control is to let go and allow oneself to stutter or to suppress it. The next few slides will dive one layer deeper into these conflicts. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on these conflicts. It's really interesting. And I'd love to talk to people who wanna chat a little more about this at some point, but I'm just gonna go one layer deeper so we can understand a little bit more about these conflicts because I do believe that they're, they're driving the struggle. So, this is the approach avoidance conflict. In fact, it's called the double approach avoidance conflict that Sheehan developed. It doesn't explain the cause of stuttering, but it explains how conflict about stuttering can lead to struggle. The speaker has competing drives to approach a goal and to avoid the goal. So for example, here's the goal is to communicate. That's the positive aspect to speech, to speak. But the negative aspect is I may stutter. So there are positive aspects of speech and negative. I, may, I want to communicate, but I may stutter. On the other hand, there's a goal of silence in that situation. The positive is that I'll communicate what I want to say. It's very important. But on the other hand, um, I, you know, there's, um, well, no, I'll conceal. That The positive on the hiding is that I'll conceal. But on the other hand, there will be lack of communication. So the person who stutters goes back and forth between the two goals of speech and silence all the time. And the way they do that are through these drives. So this black line is the approach drive. And as you're far from the goal, it gets stronger as you approach the goal. So in this case, the phone is ringing, ding, 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 and you wanna answer it as you get closer to it, the desire to approach increases, but this desire to avoid kicks in as well. And so you see this red avoidance drive, which is a steeper drive. At some point they reach an equilibrium. And when they do reach that equilibrium, what happens is that one of two things happen. The person either stutters, and then since they've shown they're stuttering, they can finish the word because the cat is out of the bag, so to speak, or they find an escape, substitute a word or trick out as we call it. When they And when these two reach an equilibrium, sometimes the person will go to the other goal and then also reach an equilibrium, go to the other goal. And so they're going back and forth between holding, going ahead, holding back, going ahead, holding back. And often this 
It involves conflict in terms of showing stuttering, not showing stuttering, or even the way they stutter, the form of the stuttering. So people might ask, how does conflict theory explain the release of the block, for example? Eventually, stutterers finish the block word unless they escape, as I said, through substitution, for example. But the, the diagram shows that the very act of stuttering, the very act of stuttering right there, reduces the fear that elicited it. Once stuttering, there's no longer anticipation and fear of stuttering. The avoidance drive is broken. The word is then completed. So I'm going to move on a little bit now and talk about one layer down deeper into the role conflict. So Joe Sheehan said, stuttering is a role-specific self-presentation disorder. Role conflict is a conflict between enacting the role of person who stutters or enacting the role of fluent speaker. Conflict of self-presentation of identity, how you identify to the outside world. So what happens is that person who stutters has an idea that they can be fluent some of the time. And in fact, yesterday I ordered my lunch and I was fluent. And you know what? I said hello to that person and I was fluent and sometimes I'm fluent. And so I'm going to try to be fluent, hope to be fluent, plan to be fluent. And I'm going to go into the situation with the hopes of being fluent and that will be my success. The problem with that is once they stutter, then there is role conflict. They've shown what they don't want to show and they have they don't have role congruency anymore. And the fact that they're actually trying to be fluent, those efforts to be fluent paradoxically lead to stuttering. Efforts to hide or suppress stuttering create the struggle. And finally, the suppression hypothesis. Um, so think back to the original chart with the three conflicts. This is the last one. This is a conflict between embracing stuttering or having the job to manage it. In other words, to work to fix it or let go of control. So management can lead to struggle from holding on to a sound when, pushing to get it out when, or failed attempts to try to use a technique or tool. So you're trying to, at <clears throat> the moment of disfluency, do an easy onset. <gasps> And that's not working either. <clears throat> the fear to hide is, is too great. And when there's a fear to hide, anything that allows you to show stuttering openly it then it is destroyed. Sheehan said successful suppression of stuttering is what maintains and perpetuates it. If you listen to, if you look at that actual um, quote, it's very, very powerful. Management or control of stuttering often includes efforts to suppress stuttering. Efforts to make it smaller, quieter, less obvious to others, less distracting in the conversation. Suppression of stuttering often includes suppression of the thoughts and feelings that sometimes accompany stuttering. Not wanting to think about what listeners might be thinking or wanting to control the, the, the thoughts of others that you think you might be able to control or not wanting to feel shame or trying to control the feelings that you feel. All of that is part of suppression. The second quote, and this is more of a paraphrase because I don't remember exactly what he said and I can't find it in the book, but I'm just remembering back, is that self-acceptance in the role of stutterer requires experiencing the moment of stuttering. And this foreshadows the partnership of acceptance and change that I'm gonna be talking about. This change is letting go of control. Now, I couldn't possibly give a talk that referred to arts without giving you my overview chart of summary of arts in one slide. And so this is a summary chart of the arts therapy approach. Um, it begins with differentiating stuttering with conflict and struggle from stuttering without conflict and struggle. Here we call it disfluency. So at the top, we have stuttering, the name of the difference. Um, under that, we have struggle versus disfluency. And you notice everything around struggle is in red. Disfluency is basically in blue. We want to protect that fluency, keep that disfluency. That's beautiful. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that stuttering without struggle. And so if you look at the other boxes below, you see below, um, um, the below struggle that it takes many forms. So first efforts to hide stuttering, including secondary behaviors, 
um, such as fillers or phrase repetitions, you know, my name is, my name is, my name is, those kinds of phrase repetitions to avoid stuck on getting stuck on your name or loss of eye contact or facial contortions. The second form of struggle, the second box in the middle, includes efforts to hide one hide one I, one's identity as a person who stutters, maybe substituting words, not participating, or just not even showing up for something. And sometimes in those in that situation with that middle um, that middle form of struggle, um, we have feelings that go along with that struggle. So when you mask stuttering, you might feel guilt for not being authentic. Or if you reveal stutter, you stuttering, you feel shame for showing it. And if you're silent, you feel that you had communicated failure there. So there are a lot of feelings that go along with the identity um, struggle. And then finally, the third form includes efforts to control, which lead to tension and effort, robotic speech, or blocking from holding back. And um, arts therapy activities actually support the stutterer to get rid of all of struggle by resolving conflict. Okay, I'm going to shift gears a little bit um, now and move away from some of that concept stuff and talk about neurodiversity. Let's consider the idea that stuttering can be a form of neurodiversity. This is important when we ask the question, should stutterers change? Someone is neurodivergent when they diverge from the dominant societal standards of normal, normal neurocognitive functioning. Most now agree that stuttering is neurodevelopmental, right? Stuttering, stutterers diverge when it comes to the brain. We know from brain research that there are perhaps structural and functional differences. There's differences in network connectivity. There's differences in motor and linguistic processing, differences in temperament, lots and lots of differences that are likely genetic, at least in some part. Um, and a lot of the research that's going on is looking for those differences and you know, kind of like wrapping up more differences. <laughs> um, however, if we consider that the experience of stuttering may have less to do with these differences and more to do with the stutterer's beliefs and how they behave, think, feel, and react to those beliefs over time. So furthermore, let's consider if stutterers are a neuro minority. The definition of a neuro minority includes this, everything on this slide. Number one, people share a similar form of neurodivergence. It's innate and inseparable from who they are. And the majority tends to respond to them with some degree of prejudice or misunderstanding, perhaps because the form of neurodivergence is classified as a med medical pathology. So are stutterers a neuro minority? Perhaps yes, perhaps no. You might disagree, you might agree. We're not gonna be debating that here today, but I think it's important to move away from the power imbalances that come from pathologizing stuttering by changing the way that stuttering is defined and described, especially on a stuttering affirming journey. So Sam Simpson and Patrick Campbell and Chris Constantino, which I'm sure you're familiar with all of them, offered a non-pathologizing definition of stuttering in their 2021 talk at the Oxford Disfluency Conference. Stuttering, stammering is a neurodevelopmental difference that leads to a breakdown in the forward execution of speech sounds produced in the context of language compared to societal norms. This kind of definition can increase acceptance because it points to a difference, not a disorder or defect, and that's okay. It's okay to be different. Similar conversations are going on in the autism community, but I'm bringing this up for a reason. It relates to change. Should stutterers change? What should change? And very importantly, who decides? As I said, these are questions that have come up in the autism community. For those of you who know me, I'm involved in the autism community. I have a, a child, an adult child with autism. Um, and I also worked in the area of autism before he was born as well as stuttering and autism are two, my two clinical areas. There's considerable controversy around therapy approaches that seek to fundamentally change the person. However, some change can be valuable for neurodivergent individuals. Patrick Dwyer is an autistic scholar. 
I met him when he was a doctoral student at the Mine Institute in California. And his lectures and his talks and his answering of my questions all helped me validate my thinking about acceptance and change, specifically related to neurodivergent groups. Autistics want to remain autistic, but that doesn't mean they don't want to learn to communicate or to read. And I think that speech therapists have an important role here. Patrick gives the example of learning to read himself, which was a struggle for him when he was young and perhaps not something that came naturally to his autistic brain. Learning to read fundamentally changed him, but also opened up the world to him. So a quote from Patrick, we don't really need to call someone deficient or disordered to change them. We simply need to recognize that it would bring them, would, would help them thrive, be happy, and enjoy better mental well being if they possess some skills. We don't need to call stuttering a disorder in order to change some aspects of it. The second quote is a reminder to clinicians that applies equally to stuttering. We can misuse the power by targeting things that can't be changed. And we can misuse it by targeting things we shouldn't be changing. For me, this message is very powerful. So what should be changed and who decides? Obviously, I think stutterers decide, families decide. I don't think speech therapists decide. I think that this is an individual journey for each person. And we can learn about what matters to each individual by listening to their stories. So. Those of you who know me know I'm a big fan. I'm not a big fan of standardized assessments for stuttering. Um, the language in the assessments can reinforce negative stereotypes. For example, how often do you feel anxious or helpless is part of an assessment. Um, they might not ask the right questions for that individual. And while standardized assessments and questionnaires may help to diagnose stuttering, perhaps, um, but they're not very effective for therapy planning. When people tell their own stories, their own way, the most important themes pop out. And my favorite example is that, you know, if you go to your doctor because you have a sore arm or something and you sit down and the doctor starts taking your blood pressure and asking you about your history and birth and development. I like to joke about that one. Um, but you say, excuse me, I'm here for my arm. And we'll get to that. We'll get to that. I need to ask all these questions first. That's not how you get what is important to the individual. So telling the story is really important and listening is really important. So we're listening for all kinds of things when they tell their story, listening for fears and barriers, listening for not only the fears and barriers, but also their values and their ideas of success and listening for all kinds of forms of conflict, avoidance, concealing, controlling, all of the things that might be conflicting um, in their communication, in their in their in their identity, um, and how they interface with other people when they communicate. One of the most frequent questions I get is, "What if someone says they want to be fluent?" I get that question all the time at every one of my trainings. I expect that, after all, fluency is a symbol of all that can be for them. You know, the giant in chains. If I were fluent, then. I would be confident and I would, I would, you know, be class president and I could, I could, uh, you know, crack jokes and do anything I wanted to do. But that's, a, that fluency is a symbol. It's not really that they want fluency. They want to do all those other things. So how do we learn about the other things they want to do? So I ask questions that are more open-ended and listen for the story. So if you made a change that was helpful, then what would be different in your life? That's one kind of question. Another kind of question is, if you could change something about the way you stutter, what would that be? Or for some of the kids, I, when they say, I want to be fluent, I don't want to stutter anymore, I want to stop stuttering. Okay, if you didn't stutter, what would be different tomorrow? And you actually do get some really great answers. And um, it's no, it's no, um, coincidence that I put in red the art out, arts outcome that it goes along with some of these things. And these are actually some 
quotes from kids that I got by asking these questions to kids. So somebody would say, I wouldn't switch my words or start over and over when I got stuck. And that's a really good one, right? Um, That tells me they might want to be more efficient in their communication. That might be something they want to change. Or my talking would be easy. I wouldn't think about it. Maybe they want to be more comfortable um, when they're stuttering. Or I would run for class president and give a speech. Maybe they want to be more confident when they're stuttering. Or I would just say it. I would speak my mind. That's about spontaneity in communication. And certainly, I would want to meet a new friend and hang out and tell jokes. Certainly, that's joyful communication. And as one of my clients once said, talking is supposed to be fun. And it should be absolutely joyful. Other responses that I've gotten from people, I wouldn't be as anxious about about, uh, work presentations. I'd be more confident as a person. I would talk more with friends. People wouldn't finish my words. I could focus on content and not stuttering, all kinds of things. But I think it's important to listen for those messages of what people want to change and not go to fixed ideas of what should change. Um, Here are the arts outcomes um, are grouped together with some of the um, uh, some of the ideas of change, and I've grouped them under um, uh, the five arts outcomes. And we're not going to have time to go over all of these today, but I just want to maybe give some examples um, that because they do relate back to resolving a conflict in some way. So here you see um, under efficiency, stuttering openly, stuttering on the intended sound, lack of escape, comfort, lack of reactivity, lack of physical effort, lack of socio-emotional effort, under confidence, self-acceptance, authenticity and congruency, self-advocacy, under spontaneity, initiative, presence, presence in the conversation, being present in that interaction, not needing tools to fix anything because nothing's broken, and then joy, connection, connection with others, connection in the communicative exchange, community, enjoying community, and balance of power in that communication. Um, so these are a lot of the things that come out when you listen to the stories, and I'll show you how they might, re- you know, give you a couple examples on how they might, re- you know, refer back to conflict. Let's take the first one: open stuttering or stuttering openly. To, to stutter on the intended word or sound without control, okay, and that, that's what open stuttering is, there's the approach avoidance conflict and the conflict and control. So in order to open stutter, you're beginning to resolve both approach avoidance conflict and conflict of control. Take this last one down here, balance of power. In that one, a balance of power means you're sharing space equally in conversation. That's also approach avoidance conflict and also role conflict. So while we don't have time to dive into all these 15 things that I put up here, the idea is that there may be many positive stuttering affirming outcomes that include acceptance and change. So what to do, what to accept, what to change, right? There's some dilemmas here, right? Can someone make changes that don't suppress stuttering or deny one's authentic identity? Can someone increase acceptance while feeling that they need to change? Is that a contradiction that they can be accepting and also feel like they have something that they want to change? So are they contradictions? I don't know. Um, What is that process like for acceptance and change? So these pictures kind of tell it all for me. Accepting means revealing your identity and what to change, making it all simpler, simpler. Talking is not that complicated. Sometimes in order to fix and control and to hide and suppress, we make the stuttering pattern very, very complicated. It's time to get rid of some things and make it much more simple. So I usually begin by exploring, okay? I'm a big fan of exploration. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about gestalt and analytical processing, just to give you some background in the way I think about this. The concepts of gestalt and analytical processing have always been made a lot of sense to me when I observe the ways that autistics learn language. So 
they may communicate with gestalt phrases that have meaning as a single idea. So a whole phrase that has a single idea and they heard it before, maybe they're echoing it, but it has meaning to them. But that phrase does not reflect grammatical knowledge or, or assume their understanding of syntax or even the individual words in terms of vocabulary. Here's an example from my son who likes to say, go out in the car. Okay, those are five words. When he wants, you know, he says, go out in the car when he wants to leave the house. Um, he's heard it before. Let's go out in the car. So this is not a creative sentence. He was not implying the imperative let's. He wasn't producing a prepositional phrase um, in the car. <clears throat> On the other hand, though, so those are gestalt processing. On the other hand, if somebody else looks at an analytical view, and down here is the analytical view of it, then they might start with car um, and then go car, um, mommy go car. You're building this pivot, pivotal grammar and building creative sentences that can be generative and can be, can express many, many different things more creatively. So, Many of my clients start their journey with a very gestalt view of stuttering. Sometimes I stutter, that's not good. Sometimes I'm fluent, that's good. It's very, very, despite the variations, it's binary. This, the, you'll see, like, if you look here, you'll see, yeah, there's different symptoms in different locations here. Maybe I'm not showing a lot of struggle here. I'm showing a ton of struggle I have an easy time here, I have a harder time here. Sometimes I stutter, sometimes I don't, I can't figure it out. But it's all very mixed up together. It's all one gestalt unit, big S, as she used to say, one stuttered moment. Another way to look at this is to get analytical about it. Explore the parts and the relationships with a focus on intent. So let me address the slide for a minute here. I ask the clients to observe with curiosity, not judgment. And that's really important. It's not like you're learning that you do something to hide stuttering and that's bad. You just become very curious about what you do and how you've learned it and maybe what your intent is and what the relationships are. So what is the intent? Okay, we talk about intent. Is your intent for whatever you do? Let's say you use a filler, ah. Uh, is your intent to show stuttering, to hide stuttering, to minimize stuttering? to control how others perceive it, to control my own feelings about it. Only the person who stutters knows their intent. And I love the idea that sometimes people say to me, is that a trick? You know, we call tricks escape behavior sometimes. Is that an escape behavior? And my answer is always, how would I know? What's your intent? So the very same thing can have two intents. And I'm gonna give you an example because I love to give examples of these things from actual stuttering patterns. So for example, somebody might say, I'll use my name, okay? My name is v v Vivian, okay? Was that part word repetition a trick? Was it an avoidance behavior? What was it? I don't know. I'll exaggerate it and show you two different ways. My name is v v v v v v Vivian. My intent was to get on the sound and stutter. I didn't care how it came out. Okay, that's my intent. That's open stuttering. But what about this one? My name is Vi 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 Vivian. What's my intent there? Well, somebody who has not explored their stuttering might say, that's the way I stutter. That's me. That's my stuttering. That's inherent in me. I might say, maybe you learn to start over so that you wouldn't show any struggle. It's very controlled. Vi Vi Vi. Vivian. And if you say it a number of times, the fear will die down and you can finish it fluently. And that can protect you from feelings of loss of control. And it can protect you from the thoughts of others and struggle that might be overt. So we really need to consider intent. I think it's very, very important. Then we have to consider thoughts, beliefs, and values, okay, as we explore the stuttering pattern. Thoughts are transient. They're subject to change, right? When they're repeated, they become beliefs. Beliefs are more resistant to change when they're usually automatic or unconscious. They're kind of like true without fact. 
assumptions about the world. And then they also kind of lead to values because values are attributing worth to various you know, objects or behaviors and beliefs become value when we commit to them or see them as important. Values can change when we bring them to a conscious level. So beliefs and values influence our behaviors and our choices, okay? So when I look about, speculate about relationships, beliefs and choices, how do these beliefs and values lead to choices? And here are some examples of them. I want to minimize the stutter, so I respond with single words. I want to make a good impression, so I'll pretend I'm a very confident person, take on a false role. They will think I'm not qualified for the job, so I'll talk very slowly and hide my stuttering. I was fluent during an interview last year, so I'll try to be fluent again this year. So if you kind of understand how these lead to choices, even if they're not completely conscious, bringing them to conscious um, level can actually begin changing some of these ideas and changing some of the beliefs and attitudes and the choices that you make. This chart helps explain how beliefs and values may begin or be part of this cycle of struggle. So in the yellow, let's say the child grows up believing that stuttering is not okay. Um, they need to fix it. They need to practice. They need to use their tools or whatever it might be. And they have experience with negative listener reaction and frustration and, and adults telling them to fix it or to change it or giving them advice of all kinds of ways of talking that won't show struggle or don't show stuttering. Simultaneously, they develop maybe feelings and thoughts and behaviors that contribute to the struggle. So if we look at this slide, we look first at maybe these things in blue, the um, thoughts about others and about self. They will think I'm stupid or nervous. They won't hire me or they won't date me or I couldn't do that or go there. I hate the sound of my stuttering. I should, I should use my tools. And those may trigger these negative emotions and feelings. And so these are just a short list. I mean, anything from fear, shame, frustration, anger, stress, anxiety, panic, any kind of feeling that may come from those thoughts. And they very often can trigger these, in, these orange, these escape and avoidance behaviors in orange that serve to suppress stuttering and create false rural identity. So anything that you do, or learn to do when you were young, even if you don't intend to hide now, they may be part of your pattern because of conditioned response learning and things become habitual, especially if historically they serve to, to reinforce escape. So there can be anything like word substitution or fillers or starting over or pausing or inhaling um, a failed technique, you know, trying to take deep breath or even limiting participation or physical body movement, or the big one, not showing up at all. This is what it looks like in terms of the conflicts described earlier. And I'm gonna, this is a complicated slide. I just looked at it now and I go, this is way too complicated, but I'm gonna walk you through and see if, if it helps the understanding. What to accept and what to change are along the left here. Um, so here's what to accept and what to change. And along the top are the three conflicts that I presented earlier today. So we look at um, here, we see um, we want to, in, in the approach avoidance conflict, what do we want to accept? We want to accept that much of my stuttering reflects prior or cur current intent. It does. Um, and habit. So in order to understand and evaluate, we want to understand what was learned, how we learned it, if anything is intending, if we're intending any of that now, if it's habit-based, um, and maybe understand that some even habits can be changed. Um, and so we, and when we change, we want to lean into disfluency rather than hold back. So sort of tolerate, invite, welcome, and embrace disfluency. That's all about the approach and not the avoidance drive. Um, and this next one, we see role conflict. Stuttering is one of my many identities. And 
that's what we accept. That stuttering is one of my many identities. It may not be one that you have chosen on your own, but many of your identities aren't ones that you have chosen. Um, and understand and evaluate the effects of masking and suppression. What to do, what to change, enact the role of person who stutters, enact the role of stutterer, and plan what to plan to do. Allow yourself and others to experience stuttering. It's not just you, but you have to allow others to experience stuttering as well. And conflict of control, what to accept. Accept that your brain and body have developed ways to respond for, to, to moments of trauma for some. Not everybody feels moments of trauma, have experienced trauma related to stuttering, but many have. And your body has ways of responding to that. And if we can accept that our body is trying to protect us, and that's why we're escaping, you can understand that that anticipated loss of control can lead to a lot of bodily and physical and emotional reactions that you might not want to have, okay? Your body is doing one thing, your brain wants you to do another. What to change? Let go of the effort to control and to fix and to stay present, plan to stay present. And that's really important. So I can give you some examples of this um, for the approach avoidance conflict. Um, accepting, accept that intent is to escape and it's not happening to you. For example, that filler that you're using, that um, it's not happening to you. That block is not happening to you. That pause or that retrial, that substitution, that's not happening to you. You can change by stuttering on the intended word. It's not so easy, I'll talk about it later, but you can actually stutter on the word that you didn't want to stutter on. There are ways to begin to do that. In the middle one, role conflict, here's an example of role conflict, what to accept. You may not have a choice in some roles, as I mentioned. For example, you know, ex concealing leads to struggle. Um, but if you take off the mask and share that part of you, then you can actually allow others to experience that stone. And the last one, where, the, where your body is trying to protect you, I panic in anticipation of stuttering. Let's say you say that I, a lot of my clients say I panic in anticipation of stuttering. So sometimes I prolong it to make it controllable. Sometimes I just blank out. The change there is planning to feel feelings, planning to allow the stuttering to take its form, planning to allow feelings to be there without having to sweep them away to compress, to, to suppress them or eliminate them. Again, being present. It's kind of a complicated slide. I hope you hung in there with me. Okay, now my favorite Sheen quote. Okay. The stutterer becomes a walking museum of everything they have tried to hide or suppress. Um, and so, so um, get rid of what you don't need. That's the idea here. Clean out the clutter. Um, the clutter has collected over the years. Um, those things once served to hide or suppress stuttering in some way. And you might be able to toss out escape and avoidance efforts to control the moment of stuttering, the worry about the thoughts of others and the worry about the feelings inside. Stutter openly and honestly, identify yourself authentically and let go of control. More easily said than done. Aren't you all saying that right now? I hope so. <laughs> you can start by separating disfluency from struggle and at least understanding the difference so that you can begin to shed struggle. Look at it analytically. It's about doing less about stuttering, not doing more. Making that pattern simpler. In short, clean out the house and get rid of the relics of a time, past or present, when your goal was suppression of stuttering. And that could have been a very, very long time ago. Many of my clients talk about the challenge of acceptance. Yeah, they. it is challenging. Um, I'm doing fine with changing certain things, but I still am on my journey for self-acceptance. That's really hard for me because when I'm alone and I'm not with a community and I'm ordering my food and I'm all by myself, I don't accept my stuttering. 
I don't like it. Now, these are honest, honest, authentic responses. Yes, they acknowledge their stuttering and are open about it, but it's acceptance is a complicated journey. To me, I think it's a little bit like fluency. It's there when you stop wishing for it or stop chasing it. Self-acceptance comes to those who stop chasing it. So why is accepting so, acceptance so challenging? The bottom line is that no one, including speech language therapists, want to accept struggle. And I say, why should they? Why accept a form of stuttering that includes relics of a time in their life when they were avoiding and escaping and suppressing and masking? That's where the change comes in. Embracing identity and change and letting go of those now habitual behaviors or beliefs or values that represent yours or somebody else's idea of how to fix you. Again, it's a simple idea, but perhaps, you know, a little more difficult to achieve. Okay, so let's talk about the partnership of acceptance and change. Um, they are truly a partnership, I believe. Um, though they do not always agree. Okay, we're going to like delve into this conflict between acceptance and change because there's conflict everywhere, right? So my position is that acceptance and change are companions that cannot function independently. And they argue, they dig their heels in throughout the entire stuttering journey, stuttering affirming journey. Acceptance will say, I give permission for people to judge me. Let them. Change will say, no way, hide it. This is going to be a disaster. Other times, change will say, I can show my stuttering openly and honestly. It might be rough today, but I can feel a little shame, right? Acceptance says, are you crazy? People will smirk and think we're weird. So they're arguing all the time. Let's accept. No, let's not. Let's change. No, let's not. They're arguing. Acceptance and change are companions that do not function well independently. Though. Even though they argue, they need each other. The truth is, neither acceptance nor change alone are truly achievable from my perspective. But, but people try. So what does it look like when you try? Here's change working alone someone who's only working on maybe the motor aspects of stuttering. I can eliminate my blocks. I just need to practice and practice and generalize my tools. The problem there is that the desire to hide identity, the lack of acceptance fuels the block. So you've got the fuel of the block going while you're practicing to suppress it. How about accepting work, acceptance working without working alone? Let's talk about acceptance working alone. This is my favorite one, voluntary stuttering. If I voluntarily stutter, I stutter and struggle less. What's the problem with that? Oh, and there's so many problems with it, but I'll start with one of the problems. The problem with that is that the struggle comes from panic and loss of control in the moment of real stuttering, not voluntary stuttering. The intent here is still not to stutter. Let me voluntarily stutter so I don't stutter. It's still suppression. The intent is to hide. The stutterer would need to change their reaction to loss of control. And that's the problem why acceptance working alone doesn't help. You have to change the reaction to loss of control. So... Here's another, I, I, you guys are probably saying this woman has so many complicated slides. Okay, so I think in pictures, obviously that part of me, <laughs> that autistic part of me um, is that the, the acceptance and change here do work together, and um, but they need to do it safely at a pace that they agree on. So there are some supportive messages which mediate through acceptance and change. So I'm gonna walk you through this so you can see a little bit um, what I'm talking about. So we always start with the red. So um, here we got the red. I'm not sure if you see, I'm seeing, okay, here's the red. Okay, 
acceptance. I can identify myself as a stutterer. Supportive message. I give permission for this person to know I stutter. I go in, this person can know I stutter. He will know that he is talking to a person who stutters, this person. Change. The result would be reduced holding back intention. Okay, now let's start, let's start with open stuttering. We decide to change open stuttering. The supportive messages, I can let go of escape and control and feel feelings. I can feel those feelings. I don't have to suppress them. Suppress them. The acceptance that results, I can feel feelings, think thoughts, and be me authentically. Here, we start with acceptance, showing stuttering without apology. Okay? Just matter-of-factly. Or advertising without apology. This is identity affirming. This is the message. And the change is it increases agency and reduces reactivity. And here, we having the change, staying present during disfluency, stay there. Even if you maintain the eye contact, stay there. See me stutter. I can stay connected. We can share this moment. It takes two to stutter. And we can both be in that space. So if you can follow these, these transitions, you can see that acceptance with a supportive message leads to change and change with a supportive message can lead to acceptance. It's such a wonderful partnership, from my perspective. So two things I didn't talk about very much are supporting community. These are essential for a safe and comfortable journey, right? So um, there are many um, uh, comics or, or, or cartoons with Tiny Dragon and Big Panda. I love this one. Which is more important, asked Big Panda, the journey or the destination? The company, said Tiny Dragon. It's all about the company. We run therapy groups. There are other options. You can get together with a friend or you know, somebody else who is in your box. We have a, a, a term in your box, someone who gets you. Share goals, something that you would like to let go of, an escape behavior maybe, or letting go of the control of the form of stuttering and let it be. You know, let that blow up that balloon and let it roam around the room. Or controlling about what somebody thinks. Let them think what they think because you have to give them permission to think. that You have no choice but to give them permission to think what they think. You can't control it. Talk together about potential risks or assignments. Do them together. Join organizations. For example, like you have right here, this Irish Stammering Association. Discuss ideas together. We, we start with supporting community. Um, and then now I'm going to share some things that people can do on their own. Next couple slides. I'm almost finished here. I'm just going to talk a little bit about some things that people can do on their own. So the next four slides are ideas for action. If you might be considering a stuttering affirming journey of acceptance and change. Okay. So first, let's demystify the stuttering as a gestalt unit and begin to analyze the parts of the relationships. So explore your behaviors, your thoughts, or feelings with curiosity and without judgment. I think it's important to add without judgment. It's, it's all about being curious when you do the exploration. And that's particularly helpful for those of you who are SLTs out there. When I do this with children, we explore with, with curiosity and wonder. There's never any, gee, you shouldn't do that or you should do that. Let's just look and see what we find. Tell your story. Resonate with others. Listen to the stories of others. And consider the intent of what you do. And actually say to yourself, I wonder why I'm doing that. You might say, I'm good. My pattern is comfortable. I do hang on to words for a really long time. Ooh, when I talk. But what's my intent there? If your intent is to show stuttering and get it out there, fine. If your intent is to control it and make it small and minimize it so it doesn't get out of control, maybe you can let go of some of that control and not have that burden. Maybe you can be sponta spontaneous and free. Identify the role you take and the potential conflict. Understand false role behavior. And I talked about that a lot. And certainly build a support system. I mentioned who's in your box in our therapy programs. We talk about putting people in the box, 
And people talk about, well, somebody came and walked around in my box, but didn't really sit down to talk. Somebody, I have one, my, my sister has one foot in my box. So people have this wonderful analogy to bringing people in to understand the stuttering experience. Next, do less. This is a difficult concept for clients and parents and speech therapists. Yes. Clients were always asking me, so if you don't want me to use that escape behavior, what should I do? And therapists are asking me, so if they shouldn't breathe or practice their breathing technique, what should they do? So there's lots of notions that we need to add things to the stuttering pattern. You have to build, we want to take things away that are interfering with authentic, open stuttering. I ask them to figure out what they are doing that's interfering with their desired outcomes and do that less. So let go of the effort to hide, express, and minimize. Identify an escape behavior and see if you can maybe look at that the more you look at it and notice it, it might drop out, but watch out what's going to happen instead of an escape behavior. If that um, Vivian, that uh, uh, um is keeping Vivian fluent, then if you don't use an um, you're going to stutter on Vivian. Vivian. Okay, that's the risk you take when you get rid of the um. Allow that open stuttering to emerge and evolve. And consider that controlling or trying to stutter well can add to tension and struggle. What are some helpful mes messages when you're doing this? We have a number of them, but some of my associates put some into the, into the bin here. It's not your job to control your speech anymore. It's just not your job. <laughs> Give it up. Talk dangerously and let's see what happens. We do that with the kids sometimes. Allow the disfluency to be there and take the form it takes. Give permission for stuttering to be there in the room. And the next one is to build role congruency. Reduce false role behavior and act the role of stutterer. That particular identity is often suppressed. So get in what we call the approach mode. Be aware of the role you're enacting. If you walk into the restaurant and you try to be a person who's fluent and you end up feeling bad because you ended up being a person who stutters, maybe you could have approached a little differently. Maybe you need to go into that situation as a person who stutters. As a person who stutters, I will stutter. Yes, I will stutter. And that person will see me stutter and that's okay. And that reduces the conflict, that role conflict. Advertise, self disclose positively plan to open stutter notice the plan plan to open stutter we have a term called shame busting planning to feel shame or other emotions in other words wow i did that but i felt shame oh next time plan for it because when you experience shame that's planned it's experienced very very differently than shame that was not planned just like you know any time that you do something that will attract attention you, you're happy that it attracted attention, but if you got some attention when you didn't want it, maybe that would be embarrassing. Make choices for authenticity. Show your personality, your sense of humor, your wit, and your stuttering. So this chart is a reminder that we can't ignore the fuel of struggle. So the dark blue list there, that's the fuel, okay? We have stigma and stereotypes and bullying and efforts to control the thoughts of others and negative feelings and efforts to fix and not wanting to feel different. All of those things might be considered everything in the water around the iceberg, right? The context, societal context, okay? Everything in the water around the iceberg. These light blue items are some ways to put out the fire by getting rid of the fuel. So resist stigma. Advocate for yourself. Give others permission to think what they think and give yourself permission to feel the feelings that you don't want to feel. Feelings are good. And also, instead of fixing, showing. And also, in terms of difference, get involved with community and establishing rural congruence so that you're not resisting difference. 
And this coming to the end here, just a couple more slides. Okay. Here's Claire. She's a member of my art stuttering groups and helps me summarize some of my ideas. Her tattoo reads, do what you fear. Okay. It takes time for stutterers, families, and even clinicians to adjust to stuttering affirming outcomes, comfort, confidence, spontaneity. You've got to enjoy the process. The process is really important. And that process involves changing one's idea of success and failure. And that's a gradual change. When clients come into therapy, they start out with success is fluency, failure is stuttering. Their idea of success and failure changes all along. Pretty soon success is, I gave the talk. Failure is, I said no, I didn't show up. So those change over time. Developing new ideas of self-esteem and self-advocacy and allowing stuttering to take space in the conversation. Changing the stuttering pattern is not a recipe or a programmed approach. And I think this is important to know. It's, there isn't a recipe for how to do this. It involves retraining automatic responses to anticipation of stuttering. And for some people, those can be trauma-based, not everybody. We need to move responsibly and safely and support each other when taking risks. And I think it's really um, important to know that you don't just jump in and show stuttering. You don't just jump in and open stutter. You have to consider weigh the balances, weigh the risks and benefits before you take a, on an assignment like that. So it also involves changing these habit-based behaviors. Um, some of these can be maintained by reinforcing nature of, of escape. Um, so escape behaviors are very much reinforced um, because they allow the, the because re escaping from the moment of stuttering when you're young is about the, the most highly reinforced thing you could do. And so um, some of these things were learned early and they became habituated and put on an intermittent reinforcement schedule and they become very, very strong behaviors. Finally, do the thing you fear, but do it safely. Consider the risks and your readiness for doing those things. In sum, acceptance and change are not only compatible, but inseparable. Accept identity and resist stigma while simultaneously shedding behaviors that represent concealed identity and internalized stigma and do it safely. So we're going to jump into some um, uh, breakout groups. And I, I have three questions that you might want to discuss. I'm sure you have other ideas. This, th these are just ideas if somebody can't think of something they want to discuss in the breakout group. But one, can we both accept stuttering and also want to change it? Can we do those things together? I mean, that's the basic question here. Two, for those who strive for acceptance, what are some of the challenges? And three, for those who want to change something, what might be a reasonable plan for you or for a client?